When is the last time you listened to a podcast about web development, web design, and small business and didn't fall asleep? Yes, we cover web development, web design, and small business, but like actual human beings with personalities. If you're a beginner, we're not going to talk over your head. It's more like asking your buddy for help. We have guests, we have fun, and let me tell you, these two can get off on a tangent. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to HTML All The Things Podcast. This is Matt Lawrence and Mike Curran. That's right, everybody. We are back, and this is episode 132. A little bit of a different episode this week, so same type of format, whatever. But uh, Mike is going into this without knowing anything about it. Uh, I'm about to say the title, so he's going to get hints along the way, but I want him to give me sort of his opinion or thoughts in each little subsection. So I have a bunch of little sub-segments after the first little introduction, and it's going to be interesting. So the title of this episode officially is The Logistics of Administration. Now, I'm Matt. That's Mike, as I've already said. And this week we'll be discussing the mystery topic we got to come up with like a, maybe like a separate type of episode the mystery style. Episode. The mystery episode, but Thank like have like a bag. new intro maybe to it. I don't know. We'll see how this goes. See how this goes. We'll see how it goes. Um, now, this sounds interesting to you, even though there's very little details intentionally and you want to support the show, you can go check us out on that Patreon, leave a review or rating on your podcast app, join us in our Discord server or share this with your friends. Mike's working on that weekly growth goals app. The link is in our Twitter if you want to check out the public uh, Trello, which shows all the progress and all that good stuff and now i'm just pulling out my iphone here because i have the notes literally mike doesn't even have access to the notes this is in my like iphone notes app so it's just it's completely hidden it's just for me and now it's just about to be for you guys So a little introduction here before we get into these little subsections so well uh when dealing with a lot uh, of users the logistics of managing them you know changes dramatically from when you just had like one or two you have to ensure that users are supported right all users are supported but and that's the most important part all users are supported. So when you have two, three, maybe five people, they're not usually all calling for support at once. So you can kind of support them all, you know, just as you, as you will. This person calls, this person emails, whatever, and you help them out. But when it gets to like 100, 200, 300, 500, 1,000, whatever, you have to make sure they're all supported. But, you know, things have got to change. Because there's so many users in question, the more sort of human method of casual conversation, as I just mentioned, and helping them for as long as necessary has to be, I don't know, quote unquote, upgraded, if you will, to something that prioritizes speed and efficiency. That's key. Speed and efficiency here. Otherwise, you'll never, ever get to help everyone. There'll be a queue that is just so long that your support is either non-existent for some people or it's just bad, right? 100 tickets come in, you spend three days on one ticket, like that's that's uh, that, that's out of control. And you need a better, more efficient system. So I have all these little subsections here. I was going to name them out, but I'm going to keep even that in mystery until I get to them. So the first subsection is documentation. So making a documentation center, meaning like a documentation website, whatever, available to your users is not only helpful for self-starters, meaning the users are self-starters, but it also works for support staff. Many times, users ask routine questions like, how do I reset my password? Which can easily be answered by sending them the related documentation, like a link to it, whatever. Um, Or if you do have phone support, if you do offer that, you can have a technician go step-by-step through that documentation. Now, in the past... I will say full disclosure that I used to hate when I called a place and they would just read me the documentation, but I kind of get it now. The reason why that is, is because sometimes that tech will actually send you the documentation because some people are sort of visual learners. Some people like learn better by being told. And so they go through the same documentation. And if I realize that, or if they send it to me, so I blatantly realize it, then I have two references. I'm being told it. I went through it once. And then if I need to reset my password again, and I can't remember, I might remember, oh, I actually have... Uh, I actually have a document that I can go through and I can actually just go and quickly update myself or reread that document. And hopefully that document actually evolves uh, with the process if it does change, like if the form for resetting my password changes, hopefully that document evolves so that if there's changes in the future, then I'm going to be like, oh, look, they have a new button here, blah, 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 you know, all that good stuff. Now, speaking about updating, updating and creating your documentation may seem like a waste of time early on in a product's life, right? You got your two, three users, five users, whatever it is. And you're like, man, like I'm spending an hour writing this little feature 
and an hour doing this this documentation. And you might think that's ridiculous. Could even be an hour and a half doing the documentation with all the screenshots and stuff. But as the user base grows, it can easily become equally as important as the new features themselves. Sometimes the, the documentation can actually be more valuable. And I find that this is true when you have a very complex feature or a very unorthodox feature. If you're a person that's in, let's say, an industry that's established, whatever it is, you have a web app that edits photos, I don't know, you're in an editing photo thing, but you're the very first, you're the very first person to do a thing, that documentation that you write as uh, get, make to make sure that it's in the user's face, users know about that new feature, you've pioneered it, it's not like anybody else, that's super important. And I'd argue, and sometimes it's mega, mega, mega important. So I actually have a direct example. So if you think about, I mean, this is, this is something that I noticed in Canada a lot. I don't know how the marketing went in America, but I used to, uh, I used to work at BlackBerry and they had, they released BlackBerry 10. And one of the things that they showed off a lot of was when you took a picture of somebody, you could rewind or change their face. So a little circle would go over their head in the picture. So let's say I took a picture of like Mike and I with a, a BlackBerry 10 phone at the time. I could like do some sort of gesture or whatever it was. I don't remember exactly remember, but it was like a circle where I could take this little like pin and I could drag the face to get the expression that I wanted. So the phone was, you know, however that worked, taking pictures of it rap- rapidly or whatever. And then um, that was it. But basically what, basically what the point is, is that nobody else at the time was doing that like rewind face. So like, let's say, for example, I hold up the phone up for 12 seconds and it takes, I'm just guessing, like 12 photos, one a second. And then Mike blinked on the time that I hit the shutter button, I could like take that little pin and drag Mike's face back. Now to get out of like, uh, specifically talking about that, the point of the matter is, is the logistics around it. They showed that off because a, it was a cool feature. B, it was something that people would probably be interested in, but C, they showed that off so much in marketing, in my opinion, because no one else had done it and no one else was even going to try it. And at, at that time, and like, I'm kind of trying to remember at that time, phones were like, they either had a dedicated camera button. So you like kind of like pointed the phone at somebody and you just click, you just click the button. Some phones at that point didn't even have autofocus. Like this is like a while ago. So it's like, you just hit the dedicated shutter button or like the, the, the digital shutter button. And that was kind of it. Maybe you could like tap to focus on certain points or something, but it was very rudimentary. No one was going to try to drag that face thing around. So not only were they marketing a cool feature and yada, 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 but they also were showing people that. And so documenting. So if you're in a web app, the documentation center oftentimes is not your marketing, but it's where a lot of people are going to go when they're curious about a new feature. If you show off, let's say a little tidbit of your feature on an Instagram ad or something, if you're showing that off and then you have really good documentation to go with it, people are more, more enticed to use it. And then you will be actually more invested in making that feature out. So documentation can be really, really critical in more ways than one, even, and, and, and it goes like tenfold for support because all the documentation always always pertains to support in some way. So it's good for marketing. It's good for, it's good for marketing under certain contexts. It's good for uh, support in almost all cases. And you should always, you know, have these links like key links, like how do I reset my password and stuff ready to go if you're a support staff person. Now, Mike, I want to ask your opinion, the mystery opinion, <laughs> got to come up with better terms for this. Mystery opinion on documentation. How important? What do you think about my points on documentation when it comes to dealing with more users than, let's say, five or ten? Okay. Uh, Yeah, I have quite a bit to say on this. So documentation, like everyone has probably experienced when they're first starting out, doesn't seem very important when you're building it. And there's a lot of reasons for that. One, takes up a lot of time. Two, when you're building it, you're so involved in it that you can't even imagine someone not understanding something uh, because, like, you know... I have a forget password link right there. How could someone not understand that you just click on that link? You have to take all those preconceptions that you have about the general public or about the, you know, your users out the window because how they're going to use the application and how you design the application is going to be two different things right from the get go. So when you're building an application from scratch, that's meant to be general public user facing, even not general public, even if it's like a business to business application and you want to limit the cognitive burden on your support team or on yourself if you are the support team. Uh, you need to think about documentation from the get-go. When Obviously, when you're setting up the infrastructure, that's not something you're going to be worrying about when you're choosing the infrastructure. But as soon as you start building out features, as you build out a feature, you should start implementing some sort of way to generate documentation, some sort of path to that. 
Like obviously it doesn't have to be automated or anything like that. You can automate it. There are ways to do that, but that's regard that's that's uh, not not important right now. But you can just kind of you know have a system in place where anytime uh, one of your developers builds a feature at their commit time, they have to choose where they want to put the documentation for that feature. So therefore, it kind of reminds them that okay, this feature does need documentation, so they have to check that box. And this, fee- and if they- it needs documentation, where do I put that documentation? And then that gets them into documentation mode. So, documentation mode is extremely important. Having said that, it shouldn't be such a cognitive burden that it destroys the productivity of your team. I know a lot of teams and a lot of uh, enterprise level infrastructure that requires a programmer to work on documenting their code or documenting the feature that they've developed just as much time as writing it. And I say that kind of removes a lot of potential work hours. So if you have the ability, hiring a customer service representative early on in the development phase is actually a really good approach to this. We have we have done it with one of the companies that I'm working with where essentially during our development, we had someone that was specializing in the customer service of our product even before it went out to users. And what that does is that they're part of all the standups. They're hearing how we're talking. And they're also usually more of a general user of an application. So they're not a developer themselves. Therefore, they're asking the questions that a regular user would ask right away. And when they ask those questions, that's the stuff that they document. And as you're building the application, a third party essentially is building out that documentation center for you. And yes, the developers have to contribute in either time, writing, or uh, you know, logic. And that's fine. And they, they, they take some time. But what, what really happens is like a third party, someone, a, a, a regular user is creating a documentation for the regular users. And that kind of helps out in multiple different ways. They're writing a much more clear uh, way of writing it because they're not so close to it as, as close to it as you are. So it's a little bit easier for them to extrapolate what the issue is and how to describe it to a regular user. And not only that, let's say that down the line, like Matt said, you have 10, 15 users. Yes, that's very manageable on a one-to-one conversation. But if you go and you grow to like 500,000 users and you're getting 100 calls a day, you're going to have to call, you're going to have to hire more uh, more, uh, support staff, right? What, What having a good documentation allows you to do is be like, hey, support staff, we're hiring you. Go into the documentation center, learn it, ask the questions from the documentation center, and when someone calls you, see if that can solve it. And that's essentially putting the training of support onto the documentation documentation center that you're building. Because no matter how good your documentation center is, a general user is not always going to use it. Yes, some more tech-savvy users will find it and use it and it's, uh, remove the, um, the need for them to call, which is great. But a lot of them will still call. But the better your documentation center is, the faster you can solve it with a third-party support team. So it's kind of like there's just so much benefit in writing great documentation that it's a no-brainer when you're creating an application that you're uh, designing to be used by a large audience. Okay. I mean, that's good. I mean, let's keep the momentum going. I like that response. Uh, Maybe these mystery episodes are going to spark some interesting conversation. Uh, So let's move on, actually, to the... Next one here, next mystery point, because there's actually quite a few, so I'm just trying to keep it going here. Self-serve tools. So much in the same vein as the quote-unquote self-starters mentioned before, self-serve tools provide users with a way to do their own maintenance and account ma- an account management. Some extremely common self-serve tools would be an account page where a user can reset their username and their password, etc. once they're logged in. And similarly, a forgot password tool for when a user forgets their password and needs to reset it without being logged in. These tools can expand to site-specific things like users generating, for example, their own API keys, changing what type of account they have. So, for example, Instagram business account versus a creator account, etc. And these self-serve tools give your users a way to manage their own accounts and features, alleviating your support staff from having to perform these actions on their behalf, just like how documentation kind of helps alleviate like longer phone calls and yada yada. Your support staff can easily send users to these tools, right, just like the documentation, if they aren't aware of them. So, hey, I forgot my password. Oh, can you go to the front page and click on forgot password? Oh, yeah, yeah, like I see it now. Thanks a lot. And then that that ends the email thread or the phone call. 
or whatever. So it's just another thing. These tools are another thing to send people to. And self-starters will oftentimes actually just discover them if they're easily discoverable. So Mike, with that being said, what is your take on self-serve tools? Maybe a question would be, how far should they go? How much should you want your support team to get involved in certain things? Like, is there some things that you want your support team to do and never be on like self-serve or should self-serve be king and be the one that just does like everything should be self-serve and just have your support be there as uh, assistance, I suppose. Okay. So if self-serve, the more, the better, obviously um, to the point where you want to build as much self-serve in as you possibly can uh, time permitting, because Obviously, every self-serve feature that you build has to be developed by a developer, tested and all that. So it takes time. And that's why you see kind of the smaller companies have less self-serve and the larger companies have a ton. And that makes sense. I think that's the progression that everyone's going to have because, okay, look, if you're on Google and you need to switch accounts, right? Like if you had to call Google to switch accounts every time, Google would die as a company immediately, right? <laughs> yeah, like, they would just bad. Like their support costs would be billions of dollars like ridiculous amounts of money so they built in as much support tools as they possibly can and they have a double whammy where they take out as much personal support as they possibly can so they try to separate it out to like you can do everything you want through our help center like that we talked about through our support tools like that we talked about but we don't want you to call us to call us you have to go through so much rigmarole and wait so much time that you're probably not going to do it that's their idea of support right they're trying their absolute best to make sure that no one calls them. And they're really good at that. Like, go right now and try to find out how to call Google for support. Try it right now. It's going to be a hassle, right, That to get a non-automated support system especially. So as you scale as a company, you're going to get to kind of the extremes of that, right? Like, Google is an extreme. You're probably not going to get to a point where you're never going to take a call uh, for, for regular stuff. But you also probably don't want to be in a point where every little thing in your application needs to be called about. So if they need to change the password, they shouldn't have to call you. When you have five users, not an issue. Like if you need to launch today and you need like, you know, you know what I mean? Like if you're building something and you're you're scaling slowly, then that's the kind of things that you can put on the back burner and uh, slowly build in the self-serve tools. But my suggestion is to be somewhere in the middle of that and try to build in as much self-serve as you can feasibly build in the most logical stuff, and then slowly add to it as you scale to uh, a larger audience. And that's a good point about scaling too, because for example, Mike and I will, Mike and I do offer hosting, you know, to some of our clients and stuff like that. And to sort of the general public, if they ask, uh, not our primary business, but the point of the matter is, is that, um, like we're smaller scale. So like if you need support, if you're a person that's on our hosting, you need support, you contact us and then we deal with whatever needs to happen. But the thing is, is that the 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 company that we reseller from, right, to bring all this into the web dev world, the company that we reseller from uh, has like 24-7 support. And the reason why that is, is because all of their stuff is self-serve, right? They got a bunch of cPanel stuff and yada, yada, all the rest of it. But the thing is... That stuff is complex, but all they have to do is direct me on the tools. So they're able to just like shoot me a quick, you know, uh, instant message. I think I can call them as well, but I never do. And I just quickly like shoot them a message in another tab and say like, hey, guys, I'm having trouble with this. Like, how would I do this? They let me know what to do. I have the self-serve tools right there and and boom, that's it. So it kind of shows how like even though there's a bunch of self-serve tools, the different scales of companies and the different types of companies will actually uh, treat things differently. Like oftentimes support com- or uh, support is heavy or I guess is a heavy overhead, a lot of overhead for hosting companies, um, for example. But then for something like Google, where it's like Google's massive, they must have a lot of support. I mean, they might, but it's not as blatant. Like we, we have gone with hosts in the past due to the fact that their support is good. We go with Google because the product is good. And then like, I don't really know anything about the support. And actually Mike, I I don't know if you remember this, but the one time we had to, we were trying to buy something from Google and they called us within like 10 minutes. And I was like shocked. I was like, who the hell is calling me? It's like, oh my God, it's like, it's Google. And it was like, cause we were trying to buy something from them for like a client uh, a years back now. And it was like, holy crap. Like, I didn't even know you could call Google. Like I was more shocked about the fact that they were actually calling, let alone how fast they called versus like, I don't know how to contact support. Like, 
And and then and then there's another thing too is like I was having trouble with like for example Facebook, a similarly scaled company. Yes, there's differences, whatever, but it's still a big web app, big web company. And um, Facebook, like I had an issue, like like a direct issue. Like it wasn't like I was making a mistake. There was an issue. There was a bug. There was a whatever. It was an issue. I go and I contact them. They're like, oh, like thanks for like letting us know, blah blah blah. Like an automated response, or yet yeah, or like a seemingly automated response. And it was just sort of like you know we can't get to all our issues, but we'll like take some into advisement, you whatever. I'm paraphrasing, and that was it. And it's sort of like. If that was a host that did that to me, I'd be leaving that host. I'd be like, what the hell? Like, I need help now. But with Facebook, it's just sort of like, oh, like it will take these complaints or these comments into under advisement, but they're not going to like help me directly with like such like a minute, I suppose, bug, however that works. And it's because like, could you imagine since Facebook is like a communication company, could you imagine like being just having a chat always available in your messenger, being able to just message them at, at will? People would message them all the time. Be like, yo, I don't know how to do this. And they'd be able to figure it out later themselves anyway. So like self-serve in this type of case, self-serve, you figuring out stuff, diving into settings, going through the Facebook documentation or whoever's documentation is really, really key. Um, and uh, the amount of self-serve you have and the amount of support you have is obviously really, really varies according to your scale, but also what type of company you are. Uh, let's get the ball rolling here. I got a few more topics here, actually. So next one is policies. So having strict policies can help direct your support staff, ultimately alleviating their extra workload from gray areas. Now there's always gray areas in something like support because a lot of staffers will think that they should go above and beyond for users, right? But then there's other support staff that think the opposite, where they think I'm just gonna do bare minimum, go through the documentation, whatever. So your users and staff will get a mixed bag of support and job quality. The support people will, you know, some people don't think they're swamped. Other people do think they're swamped because some are going above and beyond, some are not, etc. So it's going to be a mixed bag for both clients and uh, your staff. So clearly defined policies, right? This is kind of the thing that helps fix this. Clearly defined policies for your support staff will like for the support staff to follow, excuse me, gives them the guidance as to exactly how far they should go with users without getting stuck in these gray areas. So Mike, policies, I know that you and I, uh, our business is scaling, whatever is aging. And so as a result, we do, we are starting to get policies in place where we're like, we are doing this. We are not doing this. We're quoting this like this. We are not quoting this, whatever the heck the thing is. Now they're not super strict because we are still small business, but they are forming as we scale, because that's just natural. So what is your take on specifically support and policies that they need to follow? Right. Uh, so I'm going to have a little bit of a different take on this. In my opinion, policy level management isn't going to be enough, especially if you're scaling a support team to provide good support for everyone. I think the best way to provide good support for your team is to hire and treat your support staff well. And that in turn will make them more incentivized to provide better support, if that makes sense. So that might be a, a very general blanket, blanket statement, but that's kind of the way I approach employees hiring all that across the board. In my opinion, like, uh, in our, our opinions might differ on this, Matt, but it, it, like, there is a, I think it's it's more valuable to hire an employee and like try to promote them and try try to try to get them in an environment where they don't hate their job essentially. Because as soon as you get someone hating their job and especially a support staff because they're going to have to deal with pissed off customers. No one's calling support and is like, "Oh, this is great, you know, I'm loving my life right <laughs> I'm here." Loving Everyone's this calling them server, yeah. <laughs> so the idea of a, you know, of hiring a support team is trying to support them to do their job the best way possible because they're your front facing people. They're the people that are going to be helping uh, promote your company's like viewpoint because anyone that's contacting them is not contacting them. They're not contacting John from support. They're contacting whatever digital dynasty design or whatever other company, Google, and their imp impression will be based on that communication. Right. Uh, and obviously the use of your product and all that, but regardless, I think there should be more effort into giving the support team more resources, giving the support team better training, giving the support team better work conditions. And that will in turn, maybe not completely directly like a, a manager would want to have, but that in turn will provide better support. That's in my opinion. So policy management, uh, giving them policies, yes, great, like giving a support team a policy, but having them follow it and actually do a good job at it, I think that's the more important thing. Now, do you think, so the way I'm looking at policies, maybe we're looking at it differently. 
So the way I'm looking at policies is they're a limiter because they're a limiter that you need to hit and not go beyond. So maybe maybe a better way to describe it would be rules or uh, policies is probably still it because the thing that I'm thinking of is like, you know, you, you let's say you call support from any one company and this guy gives you like, you know, the, whoever it is gives you a great deal on something and they give you promo codes and they thank you and it's like a whole great experience. And then the next time you call, let's say you have this very similar issue and you get and it's within the same amount of time. So it's not like their support staff have changed and they just like stonewall you. They say, oh, too bad, whatever. And like they just sort of like bureaucrat you to death. And so I guess what I'm trying to say with policies is that I'm trying to create a de facto line, um, a um, line of best fit, if you will, so that I'm like, OK, you know, policy is if they're this if you if they're this angry, give them like a promo code, but uh, don't help them beyond sending them this link. Um, if they're at this tier of, and we'll talk about, uh, we'll talk about some of that later, but if they're at this tier of, uh, support plan or whatever, then we give them this level of support. If they're not, then we give them this level of support. And I know that that sounds really robotic and some people would, you know, maybe cringe and say, Hey, that's really ro- like robotic and, and not human feeling. Like, it's not like as if you're having a conversation, but that's exactly what I'm actually trying to avoid because there's such a difference and it's such a variance in sort of the human element where some people are nicer than others, just by default. Some people are more agreeable. Some people are less, de- less agreeable. Some people are more there for helping. Some people are just there to have a job. And so I'm trying to create this very baseline thing. Now I do, I do agree with you that just having a policy is not going to be enough. Like, I think that there would be a lot of maybe meetings or um, whatever you would, whatever you would have to happen in your particular work environment to make that line of best fit work. There's going to be a little variance, but for the most part, it's like, we offer this to the, this level of customer. We offer this, this level of customer. And that's what I want to provide. Um, But I think that that's actually healthy for both. I could be totally wrong, uh, but I think that's actually healthy for both the employer and the employee where it's like the employer in this case, uh, in my, this, this specific example is going to be like the person that's buying the product. So like they're the, they're the customer. I shouldn't say employer, more like they're the customer, they're the customer and their money goes towards, you know, employing that person and that support person and that support person, you know, wants to provide X level of support, but they don't want to feel like they're swamped because they don't want to be like, Hey, like, like, hey, I, I, I need help logging in. Some people, you just have to send them a, an article and you just say, like, this is how you log in. You know, have a nice day. Anything else? Goodbye. Um, obviously, hopefully not as blunt as that. But then there's the other side of things where you're going to have someone who's not tech savvy. And when you say click a link, they're going to be like, what? Like, uh, like my son or whoever, like, told me that. Uh, I need to click the blue button and there's no blue button anymore. And it's because your design changed. Whereas some people never look for the blue button. They just look for the reset button. But this person doesn't. And so like that staff member could end up bogged down helping that person, whatever, whoever it is, um, help that person through, through that is going to take more time than just sending the article. So sometimes some companies will say, just send them the article. If they don't get it, not my problem. And that's where the non-human element comes from. But an employee of the company, so the support staff, would feel bad if, let's say, they're being tracked with stats, of which a lot of IT people will be tracked stats-wise. Excuse me, how many tickets you have, what, how many tickets you've closed and stuff. And one of the things that you'll be tracked with as a support staff member sometimes is how many tickets you close. So if you get five tickets that have you actually fully helping somebody through something. You might finish those five tickets in a day, but the guy beside you that just doesn't care, that just sends the link and just follows the policy might close 15. Well, you know, at the end of the day, corporate, if you're in a big company, corporate isn't going to notice that. And whether that's right or wrong, I'm not here to discuss that, but I'm saying that like, I think that having like a very strict policy is actually better for both. Because even the person that's struggling will then just go to their son, their daughter, their whoever and ask, I don't know how to reset this. Like they won't like they might reach out to support, realize that they're only going to send a link and then that person will go to like whatever. And you could say that's bad customer service and it might be this type of situation. This is what I mean by it's a little controversial ish. Like it's it's like tech controversial, right? It's um, 
it's something to discuss. I think it's different companies do different strategies and it works in different ways. I don't know what your thoughts on that are on that, Mike. I know this is like kind of diving really deep into this particular topic. Right. But like what is your what is your thought on that? Like I am I am definitely more of just to like set a baseline. I'm definitely more of like I'm kind of nonchalant with people. Like I'm not nonchalant as in I don't do work. But I'm always just like, I'll like check the thing and I'll be like, yeah, this thing's fine. Like, I don't know what happened. Like, here's like an article. Have a good day. But some people that like we work with, I'll work with them. But some but like there we have websites where we have hundreds and I mean hundreds of people on them. And so then we have an issue where it's like this person really needs help and they really need help for the next four days. And then to me, like this is where my nonchalantness comes. It's like not happening. What do they need help with? I'm sending them an article or I'm going to send them a thing to test. And then that's it. Because I literally can't spend four days because what I'm supposed to do is spend like 700 days helping these like 10 people out of or like these 10, 15, 30 people out of the 300 that need help. Like, you know what I mean? Like then th- th- it's like this is now no longer viable and I'm not going to get any of my work done. I'm not going to get any of my other regular work done. All my other customers are going to suffer. All the people that we work with are going to suffer because I had to, do, you know, because I went above and beyond. So like I kind of have that baseline of I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm not going to tell you off, but I am going to say, here's an article. Here's this. Here's that. Whatever the policy is, I need to get like I need like I know you're you're one customer of like 700, 300, 500, 200. I don't care on this website. I got to get moving like not going to say that to you, of course, but that's just the reality of it. And I think that policies help regulate that. Maybe I'm putting too much faith in the policy, but I think that that's maybe a good baseline. What do you think? So, Paul, in your case, uh, there's a couple of it, – it's a little bit different because um, it's not – you're not really a support team. You're a developer and you're acting as support, which is bad. Like that's just a bad situation and that shouldn't happen, right? In a regular project, the support team would be separate from the development team and therefore they would be able to handle that a little bit differently. Um, and when you have that budget, which like, again, depending on the project, when you have a, pr- a project that needs support, usually you have a budget for that support. That's the logical way to do it. Right. And with that support budget, putting a policy on your support so that it doesn't get out of hand. I agree with you that like, you know, a person calls in and if they take an hour to log out, that's a huge amount of waste of time for the support team. So, and that has happened. Like, like absolutely. to be totally clear, like I'm not just making up a scenario and then making policies up. I've been in support professionally, and then now as an aside, just due to association with websites, and that has absolutely happened. Yes, and the way to get around that is policy, um, but the policy should be create a better approach to that support. So if we can't log a, a, a person that doesn't know how to log out in f- you know five minutes, then something is wrong. How do we do it? Well, maybe we should record a video and send them a video instead of an article. That would that would be my solution. Like that, you know what I mean? Like I would try to, a different way of That's approaching that policy. Right? Instead of instead of uh, uh, like putting it to be like, "Oh, you know what? We've reached 5 minutes of time. Uh my policy here indicates that I have to tell you to like, you know, screw off." Uh, and, um, more nicely than that, hopefully. <laughs> no, no, no. That's how you have to do it. Like you have to, oh my, God. <laughs> my policy here says the, the word screw off, uh, but no, <laughs> like, no, but yeah, obviously more, more nicely than that. But regardless, like instead of like pushing them to a side, try to think of a, try to think of a better way to, to approach it. That's right? interesting. That's um, interesting. I mean, again, this is the idealist view. Like I'm, I'm talking the idealist view. Like if you have the money, which is very rare, as we know, um, in, in a non idealist situation, sometimes you do have to be like, listen, like I understand you're, you're frustrated and all that and have a policy be like, is there anyone in the house or maybe in like, you can bring in your grandchild or maybe your kid or maybe your, you know, someone else in the house that I can try to discuss this with. That could be part of your policy to kind of elevate it as well, because there's just some people that you, it's, you just can't get through to, right? Like you can't, like, they don't know what the mouse is. They don't know what, what do you mean by clicking? Like when the basics of computer infrastructure fall out, like the very basics of it, like what is a screen? I, I have like I've legitimately had support requests and I have had to go through and describe what a monitor is and what a screen is and stuff like that. Like they don't understand the concept of 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 something of of the basics in that scenario. There should be a policy where the the, the support staff 
would like, you know, edge them towards trying to find someone else that understands a little bit better. Because it's true, you can't, like, you just can't have infinite amounts of time, you have to have certain limits on how much you're supposed to help someone. But honestly, I think that investing in a better support system, in better support staff, going back to my initial point, and making them happier will alleviate those problems of like, crazy uh, having to implement crazy amounts of policy one last thing i'll touch on is the inconsistencies that you were talking about like calling in and getting a really good support person and calling in and getting a really bad support and policy does help stop that i fully agree with that um so i again i think policy is definitely you definitely should have policies for support but they shouldn't be outrageous like there shouldn't be a million different policies and i really disagree with having policies for different levels of uh anger because I, I've seen it myself, like I've seen that those policies come into effect. When you call like a uh, a wireless carrier, they 100% have different policies for anger, which is crazy. Like you can call them five different times and get five different responses to your problem. Like maybe they'll refund you something. Maybe they'll do that. Like, and they have different responses per person. I hate that so much. Just give the most you can. If it's nothing, give nothing. I don't give a crap. I don't want to have to call 17 times to get my $10 refunded because you have these crazy policies based on my anger level. I'm going to call. I'm just going to start screaming then every time. That's, like, a, that, that's a good point. The anger level is is interesting because that that that's a really good point because I know that like that's a common one with phone companies, cell phone companies. Yeah, I hate that so much. Just give as much as you possibly can to the person. If it's If it's minimal, at least you're giving something to everyone. Like it's, it's a stupid, it's a stupid way to do it because again, it just, it sours everyone's view of them because even though you're giving them something, you're causing them to get to extreme levels of discomfort with you to give them something instead of like, you know, being reasonable and giving them that what, what the policy should be. If this person's having this issue, give them this period. No, like if this person's having this issue and is 10, 10 degrees angry, then give them this. That's garbage. If you can't give them anything. Don't give them anything. Tell them that. Don't give them anything. And you don't want them to go online and find out that their friend Bob got something because he called and was angry because that's a bullshit, you know, you know, you, you have negative connotations with that kind of stuff. I don't get that kind of levels of support. You should never do that. Um, yeah, that's all, I think that's all I want to say on that. I think, that, I think that's a good insight. I didn't even think about the anger level thing or the the different tiers of support, but not due to person, due to their actual policies. That's a, that's a really interesting insight. Um the next thing, just to keep it rolling, because we have three more topics. Um, one of them is we've kind of already covered, but uh, this next one here, touched on a little bit, but not too much, payment. So if you've used free software before, you've, you've, uh, you're have you no doubt you know familiar with this, you've seen this more than likely, support is expensive, and that's why a lot of services offer it partially or entirely as a paid service. Now, this keeps the masses of users at bay, right? A bunch of people just aren't going to pay, while allowing your staff, meaning the people that are offering the support, to offer great support to their paying clients. Now, oftentimes, this type of support is partnered heavily with self-serve tools, um, just as an FYI, so that that's kind of pulling a bit bit from the uh, the idea of like the hosting, where there's like cPanel, a lot of the stuff, like ninety percent of it, let's say, I don't know, is uh, going to be self serve. Some stuff isn't, and the support's just there to sort of help you. So that's just an observation of mine. It doesn't have to be heavily uh, partnered with self serve tools, but oftentimes, at least in my experience, it is. So, Mike. Payments. Uh, what is your thought on not offering support to people that don't pay, but offering support to people that do pay? And I don't know, maybe touch on different tiers of payment if that uh, if that's something that you have an opinion on. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, this one's a tough one. It really depends on the application. I I do believe in tiered support. Like I think that that is. A very big uh, driving factor. And in fact, that's a lot of the reasons of that's a lot of ways that open source companies are able to generate income. And I 100% support that. Because like, I like open source software, but the people that are generating that open source software somehow have to make an income for it to become viable, right? And the ways they do that is literally like, here's the software for free, but we're not touching it at all. Like this is what you get if you have issues, not our problem. But here's a support plan where if you have issues with it, we can, you know, do custom solutions for you. We can help you out. We can whatever. Pay us, you know, 50 bucks a month, 100 bucks a month, and we'll help you out. I think that that's a great way to have a business model. Having said that, there are certain situations where, like, if it's like a 
you know, a free company and there's a ton of issues Mm -hmm. and you're not, um, or a free tier and there's a ton of issues and you're not supporting those issues, that can be really negative towards your business image. And that could stop people from upgrading. You you want them to have a really good experience. That's why when you offer a free tier, in my opinion, um, if you don't want to offer support, offer very minimal features that work extremely well, like your best MVP, right? Um, And those features have to be kind of standalone to the point where the support would be minimal. And if you offer support on it, then yeah, like it's going to cost you a lot of money. And that that is where a lot of the cost comes in for a free tier, right? The support on of a free tier is is something that like we constantly worry about. We're currently like I'm currently doing a project where we're thinking about adding a free tier of something. And my in the back of my mind, I'm like, if we add the free tier, you know that that first of all, that gets different kinds of clients, not to generalize clients and stuff like that. But the free tier clients are different than the pay tier. And uh that's going to generate a whole different level of support. So we have to have a support plan coming out. Like, do we offer any support? Do we offer like, you know, seven day turnaround email support? Do we offer zero support? Those are the kinds of uh, conversations you have to have. And I think it does vary on project, but I do, I do think that offering a tiered support system and the payment increasing based on the tier. So like, you know, the business plan is going to have better support than the personal plan and that's going to have better support than the free plan. I think that does make sense, even though that might – I don't know if that seems weird. Like, I don't know if it seems kind of scammy. I don't think it does. I think it makes sense. You're you're getting more value for the money that you're paying because when you are in a business tier, you usually need to get stuff turned around really quickly because you're generating income from whatever you're paying for. So you need that support. So I'm more than willing to offer you support if you're paying. It kind of – it it generates that like – it generates a better level of service too. Like when you're getting when you're getting paid for the support, you can offer better support. That's just because of the inherent inherent uh, value of the income that you're getting from it. So, but when you're not getting paid for support, you're going to be kind of like snappy at them. And like we we've experienced that too, Matt and I. We're like we're you know we're done the maintenance part of the project. We're not getting a maintenance plan, or we're not getting enough of the maintenance, or something like that. And a person emails us like. We're gonna. We're not gonna treat it as a priority. As bad as it, that might seem, they're not paying us at that time, so we're gonna be like, okay, we'll just push that down. And that's like, I don't think there's anything you can do about that. It it just comes down to time management, right? It's like if someone else is paying at the time, we have to just do what we got to do. Like we can't be dealing with somebody that needs help from like a site from eight years ago where it, it it's been up the whole time. Now all of a sudden it's down. They're not they're not on our hosting. They're not paying us for support. All of a sudden they need help. It's a custom built site. So we're, you know, quote unquote, the only ones that know how to fix it. I mean, I'm sure someone else could figure it out and they call on us because they don't know who else to go to. And they're like, hey, the site's down because they don't know. Like, they don't know if it's broken, if it's us, like if it's whatever. They don't understand. And then it's just becomes this thing of like, like, obviously we can't like we can't be diver- we can't be diverting resources to somebody that isn't paying because we have other people that are paying. And it's just bad time management at that point. You know, it's a tough decision, whatever. But like sometimes it just has to be done that way. Uh, also, uh, we got one, we got two more topics here, Mike, two more topics. Last one, I think we've kind of touched on a bit, so, uh, we don't really talk about it too much, but this last one here, the last one that we haven't touched on, I suppose, second last, um, don't care. There's a, there's a title. So this might uh, sound, uh, like an aggressive or even rude tactic, but it's, it's actually exceptionally helpful. If you follow your policies, uh, and offer a level of customer service that you're comfortable with and aren't a jerk socially, like don't tell people to screw off and stuff, uh, as Mike put it, then, <laughs> Uh, then you've uh, done all you can. So if you care a lot about your clients, um, then you'll want, then you'll be more inclined to go the extra mile, uh, for each of them, which may be a good way to get and keep business at first, right? You're just getting started, whatever, but this is unsustainable at scale. You'll be stretched too thin and will end up missing calls and offering subpar service as you scramble to help everyone. This of course can be remedied with a highly trained support staff, but this is often not sustainable for startups and even larger businesses looking out for their bottom line. So what I mean by that is we all have like that idea of I'm going to offer the best support and it's going to be almost one-on-one uh, feeling like the, the support's going to feel like it's one-on-one and we're going to really cater to every single customer and we're really going to help them out um, and we're going to make it so that even when I scale up so that it's not just, let's say, me running the support uh, we're going to hire like a lot of support staff and really, really train them and make you feel super, super welcome. 
some companies do that. Some some companies it works for them. Some companies whatever. But the thing is, is that that often is not sustainable. And so you kind of have to have that don't care um, perspective of like you know offer your support, be there to be helpful, whatever. Follow your policies, do what you got to do. But there comes a point where some people are just unable like you just can't help them or they're asking for help too much or they're just like not following the policy they're not in it for example they're not submitting tickets they're just hitting you up on instant messaging and it's like dude you're interrupting other people's work like i didn't want to have to like you like pull the logistics card on you but now please file a ticket and that always those conversations constantly happen Mm -hmm. in it constantly happen in support conversations because it comes a point when it's like dude, like I, you know, I know you, maybe we're friends, whatever, but like, I can't keep helping you instantly. And you just have to, that's it. Like, you just have to let this person go, make them go through the, the same system as everyone else, give them the same support. So you just have to like, don't care. And and one of the things that Mike and I have said in the past is like, there's some people that treat us like as if we work for them, where we've had people come up to us and say like digitally usually, and they'll be like, I really need this, whatever it is. I really need this. And it's like, oh, okay, you really need it. Okay, so it's $100. I don't have any money. Okay, and then we just don't answer them. And then they're like, but I really need this. Okay, so it's $100. I don't have any money. Okay. So, like, they're just expecting it to be, like, a social contract where it's like, I need help. Like, I need help with support. I need help with building this. I need help with this. Uh, But I'm not willing to pay anything. I, I just need this. Like, I need this. Like, help me out. Like, help me out, guys. Like, I know you guys. Like, help me out. And it's like, well, no. Like, you have to pay us. And like, we're not, again, like we say it and it sounds so bad, but it's not because it's like, if everyone keeps coming to us for help and then the business like collapses, then it'll be like, well, like, why'd your business collapse, bud? Well, <laughs> cause I, I, I took too much care. So like care when you can care when you, when you have to care when it's applicable, when it's appropriate, but there has to be an aspect, especially in support at scale where you just don't care. You're not working for them. You're not the one, like, you're not working for them, meaning you're not a part of their company. You're not whatever. And so there comes a point where it's like, dude, like, I've done everything to help you. Like, I've offered a level of customer support that I'm happy with. And like, that's it. It's over. Like, I don't know what else to do. You need to pay more. You need to do this. You need to do that more. You need to pay attention to what I've said, or you're not listening, or you need to ask your friend for help or something. You know, it sounds really bad, but you cannot be there for everyone all the time. It just doesn't work that way. So Mike. Yeah. What is your take on this is probably the more controversial topic of the show te- again tech controversial you know what is your take on don't care um I know it can be seen, seen as aggressive at times yada yada like I said but like what is your take on it um well I mean like aggressive in this in your own sense I guess you're never gonna tell the customer you don't care or not even a customer at this point that's a good point in this, in this scenario um you're gonna be you know very respectful and respond to them being like, Hey, this is how much it's going to cost. They'll respond to you saying, "Hey, like I I can't pay that. And, uh, can you do this as a favor?" And you're going to respond with, two, "I can't uh, because I have to pay my bills." Right. So that that's the kind of conversation you're going to have. And when you're a developer, when you're in the web industry, you're probably going to have that conversation a few times. Um, we had a recent you know meeting with a family member even, and uh, we went to the meeting. We very professional, like heard them out. They they went to the end and be like, okay, how much is it going to cost? We told them the amount, uh, and they're like, well, that's way too much. Like we can't, I can't pay that. And then that's it. Like I was just like, that's perfectly fine. Um, that's how much we that's how much we charge. Uh, like our our time is extremely important to us right now. Like we can't take on projects at the minimum rate, um, at, at like a really low rate because it just doesn't make sense to us because we have other projects that are that we can charge much more. Uh, so I just explained that like, you know, very bluntly and very, uh, frankly, like just full honesty and they were understanding. They were like, okay, that's fine. Like, you know, this, this doesn't work. Um, and I'll go with someone else. And it's like, okay, done. Like that's, that's the end of that. That's the end of that discussion. And that's usually how those discussions will go. You'll have the, the every once in a while, someone just being really pissy. Um, but if you have someone like that, then there it's, you know, you can't control that and you have to kind of move on. And there's nothing wrong with that. My my approach to it is like some some of my friends reach out, some of uh, some other people like past clients reach out. If I can solve their problem or answer their question in a span of like five minutes, I'm willing to do that. 
uh, maybe not right away, but like, at a, you know, after I'm done my work or something, I'll take a look and respond to their questions and all that. Um, but if it takes more than five minutes, like if it takes more than 10 minutes, I would say in that range, um, that's when I'll usually have that response. And I think it's perfectly fine to not care about those kinds of conversations. Like, uh, I think it's perfectly fine to, you know, value your hours, value your work at what it's worth. Um, when you're starting out, it's a little bit more difficult because you're trying to find that value. Uh, but regardless, you don't want to get into a situation like where you're getting paid nothing for doing a lot of work, right? Um, you should be you should be paid uh, when you're starting out, maybe a little bit less because you're still learning. You're gonna, you know, you, you wanna you don't want to pass that learning cost on to your clients, so you you charge a little bit less. But you should be getting paid. And for your clients, like you want the clients that are willing to pay you because they know that that relationship, that paid relationship is going to be much better than a free relationship uh, where, where you know, they're forcing you to work for free and not take other paid work. Like if they don't understand that concept, I would say that that's not a client you want to have. That might be harsh, um, but I don't think it is. I think that that's completely logical. You don't want to be in a relationship with a client that doesn't value your time. Yeah. I, that's a good sum up of that one. I mean, to be honest, like it's all, it's all like it, you can notice a common theme amongst all this. A lot of it is time management. A lot of it is customer relations, of course, but you know, time is probably the biggest thing. Uh, and that's actually going to play into the next one here, which is something we've already touched on. Um, and, uh, Let's see what Mike has to say about it. So multiple methods, so multiple methods of offering support here. So much like how uh, load balancing works in networks and how like load balancing in a network can deal with like a lot of traffic, you know, simply opening up different avenues for clients to reach out for support can help you balance a load of support requests. So common methods include calling, instant messaging, email, support forms, uh, which is obviously very similar to email, but it's more of a controlled message. You're getting exactly what you want out of the customer or closer to. Uh, and different methods break up the flow of support and urgency as well. Emails, even ones that are marked as urgent, usually don't expect immediate responses, meaning like that second. However, email or having emails controlled by forms can actually make your support emails easier to interpret and deal with in a timely fashion. It helps prevent uh, the back and forth of you saying like, hey, I need this, I need this IP, hey, I need this, whatever, you might just ask for that in the form. And there's less of that back and forth between support staff and whatever to gather the information. Calls, for example, are more immediate. So they require more attention. Obviously, you pick up the phone, and you talk to somebody. So there's that um, short of like getting a voicemail, whatever. But like in most for, for the most uh common case you're calling a call center and so or you're calling during support hours and someone will have to pick up so that's obviously an immediate response and messaging so whether it be live chat online or whatever messaging is more immediate than emails of course but a single support staff can generally have a few messaging conversations going at once because they're usually sending out links to your documentation and all the rest of it so using these multiple methods you know call email email with form as a as a variant um messaging, instant messaging in, in whatever form, uh, as well as kind of tag teaming with other methods like what we already talked about, having documentation and having to train staff and all the rest of that. Um, Mike, what's your opinion on multiple methods? When should you start having multiple methods? Why should you start having multiple methods? You know, what's your take on this whole sort of situation? Right. Uh, so I think multiple methods is really important, like especially, you know, having the document could center as one of them, uh, the documentation center, and then having call support as one of them and having email support, like all three, I think those three are key. Um, and then everything else is kind of like the form submission could be key, but also probably won't be used very much. So that can be something you, you add on later and stuff like that. Um, but everyone should, everything should be treated kind of a little bit differently. Um, I like email support, in my opinion, is the best way to the best way for you to respond back and forth um, and the best way to, for you to receive as much information as possible in a call. That's all great and great and all. But uh, unless like if, even if you record the call, all that information is very quick. And a lot of the time the support staff just won't be able to record it all. So you won't have a, a documentation like a, you know, a uh, paper trail. So you won't be able to refer back for as much. So I always prefer email for support Obviously, getting on a quick call to get some clarity is fine, but if I can avoid it, I'll stick to the email as much as possible. Um, the other thing I like uh, for a more live kind of call feel is chat. Chat support, I think, is kind of winning everything right now. 
I choose chat support over any over over calling every time. Like I don't know if there's a single time where I would rather call than get chat support. Um, other than the, other than the times where chat support is really slow. So if you can offer chat support, that's I think better and cheaper even than having a call center, right? Because first of all, it's easier for someone to manage like five different chats. So you can have one cu- customer support person that's managing multiple chats. And uh, rather than a person, you know, you would have to have multiple people managing multiple calls or have a long hold time. So I think chat's where it's at, honestly. Chat, email, um, maybe form support and a documentation center. Those those are great. I don't know. It really depends on the scale of your application when you want to implement which. I think on the immediate front, like if you just uh, if you're just starting out, um, it's probably worthwhile to put your phone number and your email there right away with the intention of maybe removing your phone number down the line, right? Because as, as you scale and as you go up in users, you don't want to get a million calls, especially if you're the one that has to support it. If we're talking like a one man project or a one man team. Uh, so, but initially it's kind of like really good feedback. If you're putting a project out there and you're getting a call, that's a great, like you're kind of excited to get those calls, even if it is a support call, but you're like, oh, people are using it. And all the stuff that they're telling you is stuff that you could implement right away into your project and change it for the better. Because a lot of what I, what, what I say with UX and UI and design, you don't know how, a per, how the clients are going to use it until they actually use it. So you putting something out there as quickly as possible and getting the feedback is really important because it could drastically change your uh, project. So giving the ability for someone to contact you quickly in the early stages, I think, is an important factor. And then maybe phasing you out in the later stages for a more structured uh, support is the way to go. Okay. I think that's a good encompassing uh, thing. I agree, I agree with those points. Um, that that concludes our list of stuff. I hope you enjoyed this mystery episode. Ooh, now, uh, how, how did you like it, Mike? How did you like the format? What did you think? I think it was really good. I, I think we should I think we should continue to do the mystery episodes. I might do one. I think we, we have done something like this before. I don't, we didn't call it a mystery episode, but I think... It was like we um, interviewed each other or something. Exactly. Yeah, I think we should kind of throw it into our regular scheduled programming, <laughs> as you will. And uh, it, I, I think it gives like a little a little bit of a different feel to the episode. So I think obviously people should let us know how they feel. It's way more important if uh, one of you calls it calls it out and says it's crap, then we'll, we might reconsider it if multiple people do it. Uh, but if you like it, definitely let us know because we'll we'll continue doing it. Yeah, I yeah I really enjoyed it. Um, I've, I've always been a fan of just typing my notes on my phone and I was like, oh man, Mike has no idea about any of this. He can't even read up on this. This would be a kind of a cool little, uh, thing to get your, cause like you obviously know about support. So it's like, you do have like, uh, an educated like response, but obviously you don't have like the response, you know, to each of the different things. So kind of a, a cool little interesting, uh, way to try out our episodes. Now, I don't know whether we're going to be in web news. Uh, I know web news is something separate this week because uh, it's pretty late here. So maybe there'll be a web news the day after you listen to this. Maybe not. Maybe it'll be later. Uh, whatever. Uh, one thing's for sure is I got to stand up off of this chair because I've been sitting here for about God knows how long and my legs hurt quite literally. So um, with with my old man uh, gripes aside, um, we are on that Patreon. That's patreon.com slash HTML, all the things. So if you want to support the show, check out those tiers and give that a go. And many thanks to our $3 tier patrons, Sean from RabbitWorks JavaScript via youtube.com slash RabbitWorks JavaScript, Garrick from Local Path Computing and Web Design on localpathcomputing.com, Ryan Gadgel from Blue Black Digital on blueblackdigital.com, Chris from Selfmade Web Designer on selfmadewebdesigner.com, Tim from The Web Hacker at uh, thewebhacker.com, DL Ford from dlford.io, Bib Hashdash from Nine Block Media on nineblockmedia.com, and Jason from Geek Life Radio via geekliferadio.com. Feel free to leave a comment or a review on the platform that you are listening to this on, and this outro will sign us off. You've been listening to HTML All The Things Podcast. 
web development, web design, and small business. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from this show. And we hope you appreciate that we talk to you like human beings. And we hope you had some fun. We'll be back soon. But in the meantime, hit us up on social media, on Facebook, Instagram, and Patreon at HTML All The Things. And on Twitter at HTML Everything. Until next time, this is HTML All The Things, signing off.